Welcome to the Rethreading Lives podcast, where we talk about how to take your threads of harm and through the rethreaded process, transform them into something that actually helps you reach your potential. We'll talk with different leaders in our city and our country and find out what they're doing. You'll walk away from listening to this podcast with useful insights and captivating stories on how you yourself can rethread your life and your business. I'm Kristen Keen, and this is the Rethreading Lives podcast. Welcome to today's recap. I am loving doing this podcast. I am my own greatest advocate because I am learning so much from these podcasts, from me sitting down and talking to these people, understanding their story, understanding that how they did hard things, being able to see the rethreading process in action over and over and over again. And it is changing my life. It is healing me, healing my heart. And then it is so exciting when I get to to meet other people who are watching the podcast and learning just as much. I talked to my friend Sally who has been obsessively listening to it. And she's like, I am binge watching your podcast. She's like, it is so good. I'm learning so much. Our staff is watching it. I mean, I want people to be able to listen to this and grow and heal and the impossible things in your life that you feel like will never change, you'll never get through, become possible because you are listening to these people's stories and not just getting inspired, but actually learning practical things that can help you heal and move forward. And this one today is a doozy. I encourage you to go and listen to this entire podcast. This is Bishop Mark. I know Bishop Mark through the Potter's House, which is one of the largest and most influential churches in Jacksonville. And Bishop Mark has been involved in the nonviolence movement and in gang intervention, in shooting intervention. He has, he came from a life of addiction and gangs and has now been out for, you know, like, I don't know, almost 20 years now he's married. He's leading all these initiatives and hearing his story on a lot of different levels um, affected me. So come take a listen with me and we will see what we can learn together. I realized of all that I was a part of Mm. in the negativity of the community and it was much bigger than me being a drug dealer who was making money and trying to play Robin Hood in the community that how much I was destroying the fiber Mm -hmm. of what I said I loved and what I knew my mother loved and what I knew my father loved. And so that brokenness kind of shifted the whole uh, fellowship. And we went from just a charismatic um, having church. This is what I loved about his story is that he kind of created this persona about himself and it was called Silk. And so when he was in the drug world, the trafficking world, he was the nice guy. He was the one that everyone wanted to come to. And inside, he was miserable, totally miserable. The way that he got out was he finally got arrested, and he said he was bawling on the ground. And the police thought he was crying because he got caught, and actually he was crying because he could finally leave the life and get help. And so much a part of a story is community, is watching people who have gone before him pave the way for him, including his parents, um, including his brother, including his church members. And he speaks directly to the power of community, the people in your life that you love, the people in your life that won't let you off the hook, the people in your life that will believe in you when you don't believe in yourself yet. There's an uh, organization called Snatch, so I don't want to take their, their mantra, but really going back and snatching people out of the pits of hell. And I just believe that because when I give my testimony, I always say that God snatched me out. I didn't mm. walk out. He snatched me out. I, I was begging to get out, but couldn't get out. I was stuck and he snatched me out. So I don't, I don't have the testimony that one day I decided I'm tired of this and I just got on my laurels and pulled up my bootstraps and walked down the aisle and said, I yield, I yield. That's not my testimony. My testimony is God had to arrest me and snatch me 
and, and take away a lot of things in order for me to yield. It, it was a blessing. It wasn't a hurt. It was like, thank you. But it took all of that in order for it to happen. I don't know if Mark gives himself enough credit in this because he was snatched out. He was snatched out and taken out and arrested. And then he chose to do great things with his life out of the gratitude of being snatched. He used prison to reform his life, reconnect with his family, make amends. And he did a lot of hard work after he was snatched. It's actually quite beautiful. We were one of the largest families in Dayton. So you've got this tremendous community of athletes and stars. And, you know, I know they probably would never love for me to say this part, but I've been saying it for 25 years now. But we also had a group of gangsters. So on my mm. dad's side of the family, we had mm. connection with gangster. On my mom's side of the family, we had this connection with drug abuse and alcoholism. And so I was getting the best of three worlds. The religious professional world, the uh, gangster world, and then the whole criminal um, drug abuse world. So the gangster world and the, cr and the other world, they're both criminal, but one is from the standpoint of uh, the ones that are making the money. And the other ones are the ones who are, you know, dealing on the bottom, uh, bottom side of crime and drug abuse and alcoholism. And so, um, and then I'm going to private school. So I'm trying to figure all this out. And, uh, and then I found out that rich white kids get high too. And rich white kids party too. And so it's everywhere. And so then I became a conduit on all sides. And then I learned how to become this middleman for everything. And then that's, that's what ruined me. That's where Silk was birthed. Um, uh, I started getting high around 13. 13. I feel like I love knowing people's stories because of the complexity of people that... Mark was raised in this really good family and he was loved like his nuclear family that he was his parents. And then on the outskirt of his family were these two different influences. And then his family was able to give him an opportunity that was very different than other members of his opportunity. First of all, I love the complexity of the layers of how he ended up in this situation. Like, I, I just feel like there's this huge judgment against people who get involved in this life, right? And drug dealing and gangs, that they're all these horrible people. But it's like over time, things become normalized. And what is good and what is bad and what is right and is wrong kind of um, isn't the same. It doesn't carry the same weight as someone who's on in a different situation, living a different life in different circumstances. What I want you to hear from Mark is that it takes time to get into this situation. It's not an overnight situation. People end up on the street dealing drugs in gangs. It's time and trauma becoming normal. Yeah, so I was at Central State University, upper bound. Uh, my cousin was on campus already and he was becoming a Kappa and he left the room and in his room was some paraphernalia and some stuff and I found it and I wanted to be big time. So I used it while they were gone. When they came back, I was. Wasted. What did you use? Uh, marijuana and cocaine. Okay. So I was wasted. At 13. Pow powder, powder cocaine. Now, I knew how to use powder cocaine because of movies. I saw people sniffing. We watched everybody, everybody black back in those days. We watched Superfly and all the all the Dolomite movies. And so I knew that. And then I had a drug addict uncle that lived with us um, who was a heroin addict um, intravenously, which I thank God I never tried that. But I didn't try it because it seemed like he just looked too stupid when he was high. Like, why do you want that high? So I didn't use heroin. Um but uh, I, I did get I did see the cocaine usage. So I tried it high and then everybody thought it was cool. I knew how to play cards really well because living in Japan, my mother taught me how to play cards when I was six. So I was pretty smart. I caught on so I could beat them and 
things like 500 and Tunk and learn how to play spades. And it was amazing. And so I just became this cool kid. I went to private school. I was a good athlete. I could, I could run in the streets. I knew the lingo. I knew how to get high. You know, we always loved girls. And so I, I, I found my niche because I think I had an identity crisis at the private school because there wasn't so many black people there. We had this little bitty bus that come pick us up. And so my friends would kind of laugh about the little bus and the white people. And here comes white Mark. Here comes white Mark. You know, mm. so it was this, I called it AIDS. I called it an acquired identity deficiency syndrome, just like regular AIDS. You don't die from AIDS, but you die from complications of AIDS. Well, you did, I didn't die because of deficiency of identity, but I died because of the complications. I was going to die because of the complications of an identity deficiency because I didn't know who I was because I was trying to be what I thought I was supposed to be. It was killing me. I wonder how many of us can relate to that, what he's talking about. Like, I was becoming who I thought I was supposed to be. I mean, I know I've struggled that in my life with my role as a woman because I, you know, the church is telling me one thing, society's telling me one thing, my parents are telling me one thing and modeling. And like, when you're trying to live outside of your purpose, right? Life gets hard and life gets messy. Um, I think that's where a lot of blame and shame come in. I know Mark, he goes on to tell kind of where this path led him to. And he became essentially a trafficker. So in the world of drug dealing, the drug dealing more often than not becomes the pimp, the, the trafficker. Because girls get into it, women get into addiction, girls get in, girls and women get into addiction. And then the drug dealer will be like, yeah, you can get high, but I need you to go turn a trick for my friend. And then I'll, then I'll give you your drugs. And so that is how the drug dealers are controlling the lives of women. And Mark, when he was in the life, you know, his name was Silk. He talks about how the women already always wanted Silk to come because Silk would never make him pay. Silk would never make him sleep with another customer because Mark's um, cousin was into drugs and into that life and he could never make himself do it. And I was talking with a woman about this particular podcast who was a survivor of human trafficking. And I was telling her that I had interviewed this man who was a trafficker. And she goes, I don't think I can listen to that. And it kind of, for the first time, dawned on me that Mark, a.k.a. Silk back in the day, was kind of like the enemy of our women. Like he was the person that was part of the system that was exploiting women and when Mark got out and years and years and years and years and years later, he learned about what trafficking was and he was able to put the pieces together and realize he was part of trafficking. And when I'm talking to people about trafficking and pimps and traffickers, I mean, everyone's automatic first response out of everyone involved in the situation is those traffickers just need to be locked up, put to jail, horrendous people. And then here comes Mark, who is a beautiful man, inside and out, doing amazing things in our city. And yet, that was his past. And it, it's really challenging even more the complexity of this issue because when it comes down to it, it's all human beings. It's hurt human beings hurting human beings. Because honestly, I don't want to have sympathy. And not tra all traffickers are like Mark. I don't know many traffickers who've come out on the other side. And I think him being able to see his cousin and him being able to still be kind and be silk in the middle of this and see women probably saved his soul as well. So I'm thankful to Mark for his story, his testimony, his willingness to be open. I encourage you to listen to the whole podcast and hear his story. 
By the end, Mark and I were bawling together because now that Mark is out and he's on the other side, he has this beautiful ability to see people, see people differently, see the good that no one else can see, see the hurt that no one else can see, and that is changing the world. So Mark gives me hope that at Rethreaded we talk about all the time that shame doesn't bring healing, that human trafficking is really just a symptom of all the trauma and the hurt in the world. And Mark gives me hope that healing can happen. And I hope you listen to his podcast in here.